Cool. Hi, everyone. Can you can you hear me loud and clear? Great. Good. Um, yeah, I don't have any prepared talk, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk anyway. Um, and uh, uh, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about how we can inspire people to change. Um, and also to talk a little bit about one of my projects called Go Climate Neutral. So how about that? Yep. Sounds good. So it will be it will be pretty short. It'll be uh, I, I prefer conversations. So so I'll just kind of do a tell you my story, and then and then we'll do kind of Q and A. All right. Um. So what the heck's my story? <laughs> so I'm Henrik. I'm I'm Swedish. I'm sitting here in Sweden. Um, I'm very happy not to have to get on a flight to go to Zurich <laughs> to do this. It would be ironic. <laughs> um, uh, I, I work right now as a, uh, actually as a Minecraft developer. So I spend most of my days uh, building features um, in Minecraft and doing design <laughs> um, and uh, coaching the, the teams there in terms of how do we work effectively. Um, not a whole lot of connection to climate, but actually it turns out that there are some connections to climate even there. So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. But about three years ago, I had a bit of a panic moment. It seems to, it seems to be a process that many people are kind of going through at some point or another. It's the moment when you realize that we are in deep trouble. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty painful moment because I was blissfully oblivious before that. Uh, as a coach and speaker, I was <laughs> traveling all over the place, flying around the world. Uh, in 2012, I did a six-month round-the-world trip with my uh, with my whole family. We got four kids. Uh, we traveled to eight countries over six months and flew around everywhere. Um, never did it pop into my mind that this would be a problem, even though this was, in a sense, scientifically a well-known fact that it is a problem. So I was kind of surprised when I suddenly realized that, oh my God, <laughs> this is a big problem. Why isn't anybody talking about it? Anybody recognize that feeling? Yeah, so anyway, uh, I kind of panicked and I, I fired all my customers <laughs> and decided to not be a coach for a while and look at, well, okay, for all these years, I've been helping companies figure out how to work effectively and uh, how to solve problems. And maybe some of these uh, tools that we use, for example, Agile, could be used for this other problem, which is more important. And in fact, that this climate change problem is so important that it makes all other problems kind of irrelevant in comparison, as you heard from Ulrich here. Um, so I started trying to learn, what is this all about? You know, there's so much noise in media, um, and I wanted to get to the facts, because I know that sometimes media likes to exaggerate, right? bad news travels faster than good news. So sometimes media likes to exaggerate and just talk about everything that's bad. But then when you look at the data and the facts, it turns out it wasn't as bad as they thought. So I wanted to check, is this really the case? So I went to the facts. I, I read all of IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I read their, their reports, which is <laughs> pretty intense reading. It was like literally 1500 page reports. I just spent you know pretty much weeks just reading and to my surprise, what I learned was that the media wasn't exaggerating. In fact, it was the opposite. They were um, understating the problem by quite a lot. So the, the more facts I got, the more scared I got. And I realized that this is not a, some hypothetical issue. This is a, this is a real threat um, to me as getting old, living on a planet that's not stable, and especially to my children. So it felt kind of like crazy. Um, doing nothing is, is just not an option. So that was the kind of negative side of it. But the positive side of it was my experience as a change agent at companies is that once you understand the root cause of a problem, then you're halfway to a solution. I've been surprised quite often at what happens when everybody agrees that, hey, this is a problem. And we agree that we have a problem. 
and we agree that we don't want to have the problem. And we also understand the root cause of it. That's like, you know, a big chunk of the problem solving effort already done. So I learned that, hey, we, we know the root cause of climate change, right? We just need to stop burning fossil fuels <laughs> um, and reduce CO2 emissions. It's very simple in, in the sense that we either do this or we're in deep trouble and hundreds of millions of people pretty much have their livelihoods destroyed. So it's a pretty simple equation. Uh, what's a bit surprising though, is then if you look at the graph of CO2 emissions, it's still going up. So that's why we need to have this collective kind of cry of what the heck is going on. And that's why I'm really, you know, I like groups like Extinction, Extinction Rebellion that are making noise and people like Greta Thunberg, I saw that in the chat here, who are kind of helping us wake up and realize that this is not acceptable in any way. So that's good. But panic is not enough, right? It, it's, it's, it's a good start, <laughs> but there needs to be action. So what I also learned, which was, positive was that we actually know the root cause of the problem and we know what we have to do and we know how to do it too. At least, you know, scientifically speaking, we know how to do it. Uh, so the main three causes are, well, uh, flying is, is, is one, one big cause. Uh, eating meat is, is another big cause and uh, driving fuel based cars is a big cause and, and how we consume electricity using coal and oil. We know these things and we have solutions for them renewable energy, right? Uh, electric cars, um, just vegetarian food, which I actually learned tastes fine. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I've always been like a meat eater and I've always thought that vegetarian, you know, being a vegetarian is like uh, some sacrifice. I've learned that, well, I'm not a 100% vegetarian, but I've kind of changed my diet and now eat a lot less meat. And what I learned was like, that's not even a personal sacrifice. It's just a matter of changing habits and learning how to eat other types of food. So that was the big aha for me was that there's all these kinds of things we can do that are actually not a problem to do. Um, they don't make you suffer. Uh, getting solar panels on your roof, well, they don't, they don't smell bad. They, they work fine. They even, it's even a, a, a good economical deal. Getting an electric car, they're a bit more expensive than other cars so far, but that, that's changing. And they're, they're actually really good. So there's all these, these things. The only unsolved problem is flying. Um, there's no real alternative, unless you're going short distance. Um, traveling within Sweden, train is fine. Traveling within Europe from Sweden, train works, but it's not a viable replacement yet, mainly because of the infrastructure. It's just a pain to book, to, mainly to book the tickets and to get a good route. So right now, if I need to go to the US from Sweden, flying is the only real option unless I have several weeks and I'm go sailing like you have to do. So, but even there, there's stuff happening, electric planes, like stuff that people for four or five years ago said is impossible is now actually happening. Uh, uh, electrically powered uh, passenger flights. Of course, we're nowhere near commercial scale, but again, it's happening. Um, hamburgers that taste good to meat eaters, but are entirely plant-based from companies like Beyond Burger, um, affordable electric cars. So yeah, I'm kind of an optimist. We have the solutions. We know what, what we need to do. The problem is we're doing it too slow. So it's kind of like we're in this game, you know, and, and we're losing. Um, we haven't lost yet, but we're definitely losing. And, and the stakes are infinitely high for like humans. So we have, to, we have to, you know, kind of catch up. Right, so that's what I learned. And I made a video about it. Um, and I'm gonna do a shameless pitch here, share my screen. Let's see, there. You don't need to see this video because uh, Ulrich did a good summary. But uh, if you do want to, if, if nothing else, spread the message to others. Are you seeing this, by the way? Yes. Yeah, raise your hand if you're seeing this. Yeah, cool, okay, yeah. It's, it's, it's online, friendly guide to climate change. Google it if you're interested. It's just a very colorful, entertaining 15 minute summary of what the heck is going on, what's the problem, why is it bad, what's the root cause, what needs to happen, and what can you do? So that, that was kind of my, my way of sharing what I learned and spreading it because I realized that, A, this is actually quite interesting. B, it's really bloody important. <laughs> and C, we need the whole picture. So we can't just look at, you know, oh my God, we're all in trouble. That's just depressing. We also need to look at what, 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 what can we do? But we can't just look at what can we do without understanding the root cause. So we kind of need the whole picture. Anyway, so I started... Wait, let me unshare here. 
uh, how the heck does that work? Uh, there, stop share. Cool. Right. So uh, I started learning as much as I can. And big disclaimer, I'm not an expert at climate change. I, have been, I never was. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a guy who's been trying to learn what it's all about and then spreading what I learned. But I am very picky about fact checking. So <laughs> um, even to this day, I would say most of the stuff in this video is definitely scientifically accurate, except for maybe some decimal points here and there. But anyway, the next step was, okay, now I know what this is kind of all about. What can I do personally? Because I, don't, I, was, I was feeling bad. I was actually kind of depressed. Like, you know, this is a huge problem. And if we don't do something about it, we're all in trouble. And uh, so what, what the heck can I do? So I started, started kind of with myself. I'm like, well, maybe I can learn a little bit just starting from myself. Um, just learning, like, what is my own footprint? And it took a couple of evenings of just kind of geeking out, right? <laughs> Re reading up. Everything is, on, every, everything is on the internet, right? You know that. All the answers are on the internet. You just have to look and, and, and be, uh, you know, critical and check facts. So I, I quickly learned, um, let me, let me sh show that picture. Uh, there we go. Someday I'll get used to Zoom. Uh, yeah, I learned that my footprint was, no, that's the wrong picture. Uh, here it is. I learned that my footprint was about 19 tons. And that's actually quite large. I think the average Swede is somewhere around 10. So I was like, wow, what the heck? Where's that all from? Well, it was from flying. <laughs> and, it, and this is one thing I've learned. Anybody who flies, that's your biggest source of emissions. Everything else will pale in comparison, most likely. So that's a very simple rule of thumb. If you fly, that's your biggest source, which also means that's the biggest way you can make an impact on your own footprint, but just flying less. And that doesn't necessarily mean flying zero, but any reduction is, is, is a good reduction. So it just means being a lot more picky about, about when, when you make flights and also about how, about how far. So that was a really easy no-brainer. I basically stopped, you know, reduced my flying by, by a lot and bam, now I, I was down to uh, from... 15 tons of flying, I was down to about three tons of flying per year, which is still a lot, but it's a lot less. Then I learned driving. I don't even drive a whole lot, but you know, a car is an oil power plant on wheels. So that, you know, all it does is spit out CO2 from that, that tailpipe. So uh, I, got a, I, got, I got an electric car. Actually, it was a hybrid because I couldn't find an electric car big enough to fit my whole family. We got four kids. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but since we drive mostly locally, and I mostly take the bus anyway, then we reduced that by a whole lot, pretty much made it go away. Electricity. Well, I got a whole bunch of solar panels, feeling pretty proud of myself. Of course, later on, I, I realized it didn't really make much of a difference in Sweden because our electricity is pretty clean anyway. But in general, on average, in most countries around the world, buying solar panels is a great way to make an impact because it's just win-win, right? You, you, get, you get cheaper electricity and the climate benefits from it. Does not necessarily mean you have to buy solar panels and put on your roof. Maybe you don't even have a roof. Uh, you can just look at why, where am I buying my electricity from and how can I make sure that the company I'm paying is a company that focuses on renewables. So that was like, okay, I reduced my emissions from 19 to five. And my big aha was that, oh, that wasn't even hard. <laughs> It was actually easy. So I'm like, why didn't anybody tell, this, tell me this before, right? Again, it was this kind of surprise. But then I was like, wait a sec, now what? Should I just say I'm done, you know? <laughs> um, like 19 to five, okay, so I managed to reduce 14 tons per year. That's not a big number compared to 30 or 40 billion, right? You know, <laughs> 14 compared to 30 billion. It's just, it's not a nice comparison just looking at the worldwide emissions. So maybe I can reduce it further. How can I reduce the rest? And I'm like, well, I can't unless I die, right? That, that, that last five, I can't get to zero. As long as I'm alive, I'm gonna have some kind of impact. So I realized that there's a natural limit to what I can do with just my own footprint. So that was like, okay, now what? Um, how can I scale this? And I'm like, wait a sec, maybe I can figure out a way to help others discover ways to make an impact. So I started exploring different ways and I finally ended up co-founding a company with a couple of other people um, called Go Climate Neutral. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So let me, let me share the screen again. Uh, let's see. 
there. So what the heck is Go Climate Neutral? Well, a little bit of background. One of the things that, things that I learned in my kind of amateur research was that money can make a big difference, but only if used in the right way, right? So when I bought my hybrid car, that cost quite a lot of money, like a ton of money. And yet the impact, which was maybe two or three tons per year, was actually rather small compared to the amount of money I'm spending on that. So is there a better way to spend the money? And I learned that if I put that same you know, amount of, of, of euros and I use that to help finance a solar panel or, or a, a solar energy plant in say Thailand, which is mostly coal based, then the same exact amount of money will make an order of magnitude bigger difference. And so I'm like, wow, you know, that was another big aha. Like we, this is one planet. There's, there's, there's one atmosphere. So um, we should really think about where am I putting the money, right? If, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go beyond just reducing my own footprint and I want to put my money to good use, where would I put the money? And I learned that, you know, it could, there, it could be a difference in a factor of 1000, how big difference the same dollar will make depending on what, what exactly you do with it except that normal people would never figure this out because you have to spend time. You have to be kind of geeky and kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, <laughs> kind of persistent about it. So I can't expect, you know, normal people to do that. So that was my big aha. We need to make this simple for people because at, at, the, at the end of the day, the only viable strategy to become carbon neutral as an individual is, is to, um, reduce your own footprint as much as you can and then offset the rest since you can't physically get to actually zero. So, okay, uh, but how do we effectively offset? How do we effectively put money to good use? And uh, there's actually a ton of services that help you do that. Basically services that do what we do. I'll get back and talk more about Go Climate Neutral in a moment. Uh, but, you know, that companies that, that provide the service of here, take my money and, and please turn that into climate benefit. However, what we learned was that a lot of those sites weren't very good, <laughs> to be honest and blunt. They just weren't very good. Um, either they were too complicated. So you would spend like a lot of time filling in lots of details about exactly how much you fly, where you fly, what you eat, where you live. And most normal people won't, won't do that. The only people who will do that are the people who are already into, you know, like who already are climate activists. And those people, we don't need to reach them. They're already doing the right thing. We need to reach the masses, right? That, that massive group of people, that growing group of people that are just normal people that are realizing that climate change is a problem that's actually going to affect them in their lives. And they're like, oh my God, what can I do? But they don't want to spend hours trying to figure out. So how do we reach that massive group of people? So the services we found, they were often too complicated and often ineffective. Like 80% of the information that you are filling in is not important. For example, recycling. Recycling is great, but it's kind of irrelevant compared to flying in terms of just order of magnitude. So if you have to pick, I would say, you know, ignore recycling and just reduce your flying first and then reduce your driving, at least the fuel cars, and then reduce your meat eating. Then you can think about recycling for example. So that order of magnitude difference was not visible in any, any, any of these sites. So you would spend a lot of time filling in information that wasn't really that relevant in, in comparison. So we're like, okay, it needs to be simpler. Plus, um, in some cases, there was a reliability problem. Who is behind this site? What happens with the money? I can't even see. Um, maybe the company wants to do the right thing, but they're not following up. So maybe my money is being used to protect rainforests in some place in Brazil, but what they're actually doing is paying some farmer to not burn down his trees. So then he doesn't burn down those trees this year. <laughs> he burns it down next year, or maybe he doesn't burn down these trees, but he burns down these other trees instead. So now the net effect was, was zero. And it's not because the farmer is evil or anything. He's just trying to make a living. So at the end of the day, it's actually really tricky to find ways of, of using money in a way that's well, simple as a user, um, and uh, economically effective, as in this, the smallest amount of euro causing the biggest amount of carbon uh, climate benefit, um, and also actually reliable. Is there somebody who's you know, following up on this? Is there any certification involved, verification? So that's when we realized this is not solved. Maybe we can solve it. So that's what we've, what we've been doing. We built this service. So let's have a look at it again. 
Um, and it was really just a social experiment first. We just put up this service where you can uh, basically, um, are you, you're, you're seeing this picture, right? Hands up if you can see it. You guys still there? Everything cool? Hands up if everything is fine. You're hearing me and seeing stuff. Yeah, good, good. I need the feedback sometimes. Otherwise, I, yeah, I get uncertain. <laughs> So yeah, uh, the basic idea is you go in here and you kind of fill in a really simple, it's just four fields. Like, okay, um, you know, how, how much meat do you eat, right? <laughs> Especially beef is, is the biggest impact. And then driving, you know, how much do you drive? What kind of car do you drive? And then flying, how much do you fly? How far do you fly? Very crude, but it lets us figure out your footprint roughly. And, it, and we don't need an exact number. We don't need, you know, because the exact number is going to be wrong anyway. So we want a number that is roughly right instead of precisely wrong, right? Um, and just for in case, we double it. So it's kind of like, you know, imagine there's a building on fire. Uh, in this case, it's our planet. But let's say there's a building on fire and you're going to pour water on it. We don't try to figure out exactly how many liters of water is needed to shut this fire. We approximate it and then we double it because it's faster. Just, I don't know exactly how many liters, but I know roughly how many. We're going to multiply it by two or by 10 and just bring on as much as we can because that's the situation we're in. So uh, yeah, that's what we do here. We approximate your carbon footprint and then we just double it and then we offset that for you. But you're paying. <laughs> so basically we give you a price tag. So in this case, this profile will pay 5.4 euros per month, which is surprisingly low. And this was our big surprise that actually if the money is used effectively, a little bit of money can make a big difference. Uh, so what we learned was, A, the price tag is a lot lower than you think. And B, a lot of people started doing this. So now we have, without any, you know, we haven't really spent a lot of money or time marketing this. It's kind of a, a bottom-up kind of guerrilla thing. But now we have, um, what, 3,600 users that are paying us every month. And we've made a verifiable difference of 200,000 tons in this service. Plus, we're also helping companies figure out how to reduce their footprint. So actually, it's probably another 100,000 tons based on that. And this was my big aha. I started with just myself, right? And <laughs> reduced from, from 19 to 5. So my personal impact was 14 tons, and I was super proud of it. But by starting a company that helps other people, now suddenly my impact was indirectly 200,000 tons. So that was another big aha. Like, uh, big aha. Like, where are the levers I can pull, right? I know how to build companies and, and build products. So that was a lever I could pull. Maybe other people could go out in the streets and protest or could, you know, are good at lobbying for politicians. Or maybe you're, you have a company of your own and you can figure out how to reduce your own footprint. You know, you need to look at what is, what is your situation and what can you do from where you are right now? Because the only thing that's completely certain is that if you don't do anything, that's the worst thing you can do, right? So anything is better than nothing. Even if it's just one ton difference, that ton counts, right? Every ton counts. So I learned that there are some kind of mental pitfalls and I'm going to show one of them with, with a, a little picture here, uh, here. And this is about mindset. Um, this is a picture from my video. What I learned is that there's a lot of different ways people react when they, when they come to grips and realize, oh my God, this is big. Um, one reaction is denial. And it's a pretty understandable reaction. You see this horrible thing, you kind of want to look away and just live your life. Um, so, but that, that's useless, right? It's a useless reaction. It doesn't help solve the problem. So then what? Panic is another reaction, right? Just going, oh my God, this is crazy. We're all going to die. You know, that doesn't help either, right? It just makes you feel bad. It makes everyone else around you feel bad as well. And it doesn't solve anything. Although sometimes it is a necessary first step to do the next thing. Um, shame is another common reaction that we just feel bad, right? Just keep living our lives and just feel like, oh my God, you know, this is really bad. And you feel ashamed, like, oh my God, I'm getting on another plane. I'm getting into my car. Uh, my kids are going to hate me, right? This kind of shame thing. Again, doesn't help. Doesn't, doesn't do anything. It just makes you feel bad. Blame is the worst one. <laughs> blame doesn't, is not just useless. It actually causes damage. So blame, right, is when I say, why should I do anything? Because China has a much bigger footprint. Well, first of all, you need to look at per capita, right? Not, not, not at a country. That's completely pointless to look at the sum of a country's footprint. Per capita is, is more relevant. And second of all, blame is pointless. Because if everybody looks around for someone else that's worse and points at them, then nobody's going to do anything. 
right? And then we all suffer together. So it's just lose-lose. Very, very simple logic, right? You don't need to think a lot to realize that blame is completely, utterly pointless. So by, by process of elimination, the only thing that works is acting, doing something. I don't care what other people are doing. Some people are doing nothing. Some people are climate deniers. Some people do wonderful things. I don't care. What I think about is what, what can I do personally and what can I do to inspire others to do things? And if they choose not to, I'm not going to waste energy on them. I, I spend my energy helping people who actually want to do, who actually want to make a difference. So my mental metaphor is this. We got this huge rock, right? It's rolling down the hill. The more people that push against it, the slower it's going to roll. So just, just, just keep pushing. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of the story. And maybe you're curious about what we actually do with, with this money and go climate neutral. Um, and uh, let me uh, show some examples uh, where we share uh, back to the web. Uh, what we do basically is people pay us money and then we make sure that that money is used in the most effective way. And we balance various things. Uh, we try to... Um, first of all, we, 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 we spend money in countries that have a high carbon footprint because that's a really low hanging fruit, right? If we go to countries, for example, that use a lot of uh, um, uh, coal and oil energy, you know, there like uh, hydropower or, or solar or wind makes a massive difference. Um, but we also uh, focus a lot on verifiability. And what we've learned is that when it comes to verifiability, energy is pretty good. It's pretty easy to measure and follow up on energy projects to see what is the actual impact. So you'll see on this list, it's mostly energy, it's solar, hydropower, biogas. Um, we have some things like cook stoves. I think we also have some things about trees, but those are a lot harder to verify. So they, they may be great, but so far we, we've kind of over-indexed on, on uh, um, like uh, having verifiability. Later on, as we grow, we may partition our kind of funding and say that maybe 80% of our money is used for verifiable safe bets. Maybe 10% of our stuff is used on more things that are harder to verify, but where general consensus is that's a good thing. For example, planting trees is just generally a, you know, considered to be a good thing, even though it's hard to measure. So the more trees, the better. So anything we can do to support that. And maybe we reserve five or 10% for wild and crazy things, right? We'll find this crazy uh, inventor who has some new technology for carbon capture and he can't get funding because he can't prove that it's going to work. But we'll just give him tons of money and just give him the benefit of the doubt because if it works, then it's, a, it's wonderful. So that's some possible, possible futures for us. But our main goal is really to A, inspire people. So we have a newsletter. We help people you know, with simple tips like what can you do to reduce your footprint, right? I already mentioned the flying, driving, and food. But in practice, right, what are some, you know, if you're a meat eater and you want to go vegetarian, what are some good recipes, for example? Or if you want to go on vacation, you don't want to fly far, what can you do instead? What are, the, what are other fun things you can do that fulfill the need of vacation without burning lots of tons? So little things like that. Um, so we inspire people and, and we, we give them a way to you know, offset whatever they have left of their carbon footprint. So I'm going to mention two other examples of, or actually I'm going to mention several other examples of inspiring people to change. Um, if you're interested, or if not, we can stop and talk here about Go Climate Neutral. So hand up if you wanna hear some more examples of other situations where, where we can make a difference. Okay, that's a few. So um, one is like now at Minecraft. Um, Minecraft is, is the most successful video game in the history of video game development. There's no game that even gets near. So we have 110 million active users that play Minecraft every month. So the question there, so the, one of the first things I did when I came in there was to kind of start asking questions and find other people at Mojang, which is the company that builds Minecraft, that are thinking about how can we use our amazing platform to influence the world? And we've been experimenting a little bit, but now one thing is happening actually uh, tomorrow. <laughs> By random coincidence, tomorrow we're running a charity event called um, Love Tropics. It starts in 23 hours, 29 minutes, and 49 seconds. <laughs> and it's basically people playing Minecraft on a modded version of our, of our system. Um, it's, a, it's a world of you know, where climate change was not solved. What happens? 
So we have all these situations where the, the, the sea levels are rising, there's acid rain, uh, there's, there's forest fires, and then we create this context where you kind of have to survive there and there's games around it. It's intended to be challenging and a little bit fun, but also educational, showing people that this kind of crazy world, this is the world we're going to live in if we don't solve this. And there are things we can do about it. So this is just one example of using our amazing you know, platform of millions of users to kind of educate them. We've also thought about like what we build in the game. So we recently introduced bees in Minecraft. So you can, you can raise bees, you can colonize bees, um, take care of them. And, and it's just a way of showing people what bees are and that they're not just nasty creatures that, that, you know, that sting you. They're actually critical for our ecosystem and they're, they're endangered. Uh, so we're using our platform to teach people um, at, in all ages uh, to learn more about bees. So that, that's one example. Um, another example I want to bring up is uh, one of my colleagues at CRISP, it's my consulting company, started a company called Climate View. And this is an amazing, amazing story. Um, this is definitely going to be a TED talk or something soon because it's just, it's just fantastic, the whole thing. Um, basically, the guy who started this, his name is Tomer. Um, he wanted to find out a way to, to help countries to be focused in the way they deal with, with reducing um, their footprint. Because there are an increasing number of, of countries that, you know, that are thinking at kind of at a government level have made commitments, for example, to, to the Paris Agreement that actually have a climate roadmap and want to reduce their footprint. The problem is how do they do that effectively? It turns out that they don't have the ways of doing this. Their way of working is years of, you know, of like uh, uh, studies and then decision-making long processes. And then you, you start some project and then years and years later, you evaluate how it worked out. It's just too slow and too ineffective. So my friend basically found a way to sneak in agile road mapping techniques into the, the highest government levels uh, to help them figure out how to effectively uh, reduce the carbon footprint of, of a country or a city or, or, or some region inside a country. And it's really based on, for those of you who know about Agile, it, uh, ag uh, uh, wrote, uh, story mapping techniques. So in this picture behind, um, I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, you can see like uh, at the top level is what is the total footprint of our country? And, and that gets divided into well, what, is, what comes from transport, what comes from industry, what is from agriculture. Um, and then based on that, you realize that, well, okay, the biggest thing is transport. What can we do? Well, we can introduce uh, reduced energy use. We can introduce a carbon tax. We can introduce roadway fees. We can replace our buses with electric buses. Which of those things is going to give the biggest impact for the lowest cost? And then this is a way of working as a team, as a cross-functional team at a government level to effectively drive policymaking for reducing the footprint of that country. We started with Sweden, and now we see this getting hugely popular in, 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 in like other countries. And it's, it's quite fascinating. But maybe the biggest aha, and this was just a few months ago, had a massive aha, um, I'll stop sharing again, um, is that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit naive. I live in Sweden. We have kind of a working government <laughs> for the most part. What I'm learning now from, you know, well, also from traveling, but also from some of my friends that travel around to other countries, basically is no climate agenda. There is, you know, basically people don't care uh, in some cases in the government level at all about this problem. It's like, my God, well, what, what can we do? What if there is no climate agenda at the government level? Well, it turns out you can influence them. And what's happening is these grassroots movements, such as Greta Thunberg, such as Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, and all kinds of similar groupings, it, it's working. That's what's really cool because we've seen examples of, of, of countries Literally, well, one of my friends was going to teach a workshop for one of these groups of, of kind of, uh, of like climate activists, a workshop in like how to use this tool to effectively uh, work on, on reducing footprint. Well, that country's president showed up to shake hands with, with my friend who showed up to run this workshop. And there was a, a, TV t a TV crew filming the president saying that this is really good. I'm really glad you're, you're helping us, blah, blah, blah. As he's like, oh my God, what the heck? Why is the president here? It turned out that this guy is actually doesn't give a crap about the climate. That's what everyone said. He doesn't give a crap. But now he has to pretend he's giving a crap because there's so much pressure from below. So he's not going to get voted. He's not going to stay in business, uh, in, in office, unless he at least does something. And this is the pattern we're seeing, that even the most reluctant politicians and leaders are, are feeling pressure from below that they need to do something. So I have to say... Every time I read a research paper, a scientific research paper, I get pessimistic. But when I look at what's happening in the world in terms of action, 
I get kind of optimistic. We're losing the game we're way behind, but there's an increasing mass of good stuff happening, but it does boil down to personal action. So what I really hope all of you guys will do coming out of here is really think about what, what can you do? And if you catch yourself making excuses, stop, just stop, right? Stop thinking, no, they should do something or no, my contribution is so small in comparison to the whole problem. You can't think like that. It doesn't work. It doesn't solve anything. Instead, you just need to look at what, what can I do? Even the tiniest little thing. And what we've learned from our, our little social experiment, Go Climate Neutral, and this is also validated by science to a certain extent. We've looked at several research papers on kind of um, like human behavior and learned that there's this principle called the foot in door principle, which is that when you, when you make one small action, you're more likely to make other actions in the same direction. It's just something about our brains. So according to that research, if we can get people to make one, do one small simple thing that's good for the climate, they're more likely to become aware of the problem and start doing more things. And we've seen this validated uh, empirically at both companies and also with people. We followed up on our users and our 3000 users to find out when they become our customers, are they gonna fly more? Are they gonna say like, ah, I paid now, so now I can fly more. Or is it the opposite? Are they becoming climate aware and start to look at what is their total footprint and how can they influence their company, their friends, their government? And it turns out that just about everybody that we followed up with um, is, is either doing nothing different, which is not good, but also not bad, or they're doing something. They're really trying to figure out a way to, to continue to reduce their footprint. So we've learned that this strategy of making it really simple for people to do one small thing that's good is a great way of kind of making people less depressed and more inclined to actually looking, looking a little bit further. So yeah, the, if I were to summarize my whole you know, journey and what I've learned so far, it really is uh, every, every ton counts. So look for ways to do something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry, for the, for the great jam talk that you made. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to need to have that question repeated by someone closer to the mic. Um, but I mean, maybe Hannah, you could try this. Uh, let me get a feedback, but I can mute uh, mute here. That's no, not a or, or either that, or you can or you can move a microphone around so I can hear. So I I, I couldn't really yeah, hear. Yeah, that. We, will, we will try with the mic, uh, Henrik. That's, uh, yeah, that's the problem. Um, oh, we have feedback oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> ah! Again. Is there a chance to incorporate other things besides flying or in addition to flying, like the use of textiles that are imported from far away or things like that? Yeah, what's, what's interesting is um, we, and by that I mean the whole kind of community, is learning more and more about you know, what things make a difference and what is the carbon impact of things. So just a few years ago, we were blissfully unaware of that food had anything, anything to do with the problem. At least most people were unaware. When I made the first version of my climate video, I didn't even bring that up. It escaped me completely. And then someone mentioned it and I started looking into the numbers and I'm like, oh my God, this is huge. Uh, and, and the more time passes, the more huge it gets as scientists are realizing, that, oh my God, this is big. We just haven't done the math before. So there may be more, more things like that happening. Maybe we'll learn you know, in half a year that, uh, you know, how we buy clothes is even, even bigger than, than, than food. So I'm definitely open to learning that and we should all be. I think it's really important to think about scale though, right? So um, it's better to do something than nothing, right? So if I fly a lot, I eat a lot of meat and I drive a lot and I don't change any of that, but I do try to reuse my clothes a little bit more. Sure, that, that is gonna make an impact, most likely very small. But even, like I said, every ton counts. So 
do it, right? That might be your first step that later on leads to more steps. I would, I would cheer you to do, for doing that. But at the same time, I'd also ask you to think a little bit first. Like if you're gonna make a change, maybe consider making a change that has the biggest impact change, uh, it, it, you know, if it's equivalent to you. So try, 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 try to get the numbers is, is just my, 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 my suggestion. Any more questions? Here? One in the back of the room. Go for it. Yeah. Um, my question is, is it all about the carbon footprint? I can't hear. I'll repeat it. Is it all about the carbon footprint? Uh, because there are many other environmental in impacts. Are we talking about envi environmental impacts or causes of the problem? Um, are you talking about causes of the problem or environmental impacts? Well, then, what is the difference? Well, what, what I mean is that carbon does not, as far as I know, cause any, any uh, impact, uh, but, but it causes temperatures to rise and that causes impact. So that, that's why I was asking because there's all kinds of environmental things that are pro problematic, right? For example, plastic in oceans and, and things like that. Um, but again, I like to compare and, and put a sense of scale in. And as far as I've seen, as far as I'm concerned, global warming is the big one that makes all the other ones pale in comparison. So I would love to, you know, we should solve lots of environmental problems, but if we don't solve global warming, then the other ones don't matter as, as, as far as I see, because that one problem is gonna uh, trump everything. Uh, do you plan to spend any money from low carbon neutral on raising awareness? Uh, if we, are, are, we, are we spending money to raise awareness? Was that the question? Yep, exactly. Um, no. Not directly, but indirectly. So we haven't ruled that out for the future because our single mission is to stop climate change. That's our single mission. Everything we do is measured against that yardstick. So if we in the future conclude that our money is better spent lobbying, then we'll do that. So far, we've you know, we, we found that our, our very limited uh, resources and money has been very well spent in the sense that a small team of like three people working part-time uh, has built a product that has stopped 200,000 tons of CO2. We found that to be a good impact for quite little time. Um, as we grow, in fact, we just have grown. Now we're eight people. We'll probably diversify a little bit and we'll have multiple, I'm just guessing here, but we'll probably have multiple like departments focusing on different things. So one would be product development, like now building this service that enables people to, to do the right thing. But we might have other departments that should support research and maybe to, to, uh, to drive uh, um, you know, political agendas. I'm not sure. Right now, our impact uh, um, has been, in terms of influencing people, has been indirect. So our users are influencing other people. Uh, our articles, our videos are spreading. And sometimes I meet people in, in, at high level positions in government or in companies that are saying, hey, I saw your video or, or, your, or your talk or your article, and I decided that we're gonna start doing something. But that's so far been quite random. What we're hoping, a little bit, you know, like my experience in the past is that, like I'm, I, I used to work at Spotify and I made this video called Spotify Engineering Culture, which was about how we work at Spotify. And I was completely blown away by the impact this video had. Like literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of companies around the world have radically changed the way they work because they saw this video. And it came to be known as the Spotify model. And a lot of people think it's some kind of framework we designed. It wasn't, it was an accident. I just put out a case study and it, it was the right message at the right time and lots of companies changed. And I'm like, I could never have engineered that change. I, you know, I could never have spent money to make that happen. Instead, I spent three, you know, a few weeks making a video which happened to, to be targeted the right way and that caused a viral thing to happen. So that's what I think is happening here and will happen and should happen is that companies like ours and you know, lots of other people doing similar things, we get a critical mass. So maybe when our Go Climate Neutral, when we spread more internationally, now mostly it's people in Sweden and some other countries that know about us, but I'm hoping we're gonna have like people all over the world using our service and then causing buzz in different countries, maybe. Um, also, as we grow, we're starting to have a lot of we started to get quite a lot of money to, to spend. Like uh, our turnover is quite high. Like we get, you know, we have these 3000 people paying us every month. So we, we realize at this rate, maybe in one year, we can on our own finance a whole, a whole uh, like we can, we can close down a coal power plant, just us alone. 
And it's like, so now we start having impact. Maybe we can use that to influence people. So I'm hoping as we grow, uh, we'll have more muscle to be able to do more things um, than just finance various uh, energy projects around the world. That was a long answer. I have a quick, <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question, Henrik. You say growth. What is the growth plan for Go Climate Neutral and how are you organized? Are you, and, and how is the organization set up for that? <laughs> And the organizational setup is basically we have a full-time team now. We didn't have that even half a year ago, but now we do. So it's about, we had three people who started this like last week. So we just now decided to grow um, the team and create essentially like a scrum team. Uh, my experience as a coach is that there's no better, there's no more effective way of working than one single scrum team in terms of bang for the buck. Because one single cross-functional scrum team very cross-functional in our case. We have engineers, we have climate scientists, we have activists, we have a very wide range of kind of people um, that complement each other in this rather small team. So small team that is, that is very uh, cross-functional and mission-driven and very focused. There's just no more powerful unit of solving problems in my experience. So th that's really our plan. This one team, we're not gonna grow as it is now very fast in terms of people but we want to use um, levers and kind of uh, scale our results um, by influencing people and by building services of various sorts and things like that. We don't know about the future. Uh, again, we're always in this kind of curious mindset, which is how can we make the biggest impact? Maybe, maybe we'll learn in the future that actually the more people, the better. If we can build an army and then we'll make a bigger impact, well then, okay, we will build an army. We will raise money and we will hire people all around the world and we'll become really huge. But it's not a goal. So that's really important. Most companies are driven by profit or by growing in terms of size. And we're definitely not. We're only, only driven by biggest climate impact with smallest effort and, and money. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We have one question online. Yeah, so we have a question from Flavia who asks, um, if I wanted to engage directly in projects, what website would you recommend for me to take a look at? Uh, I would recommend for you to create that site uh, because <laughs> I haven't found it and, it and it really upsets me because I get this question so much, especially from like university students that are just finishing and they're like, okay, I'm about to go into career now and climate change is breaking my future. So I want to work for a company that's, that, that's doing something about this. And if someone finds, um, a site that is a good and reliable summary of these are the places you can go. These are the companies worth supporting. It doesn't even need to be companies that have as their main goal to solve climate change. It might be two lists, right? One list of companies that are really making a difference. Uh, if you work there, then you are working for climate change. The other list could be companies that have some other business, but who are also doing some good with, with climate change. So if you're gonna pick a company, you know, pick from these, one of these two lists. If you find that, please let me know. And we will use our platform to help spread that and, and amplify it. More questions from the, yes. from, from the Zurich uh, media? <laughs> one more from Zurich. That's a long one. So this is not a question, but enforcing what Henrik said. My experience at this year's Agile Lean Europe uh, unconference, me and a few other crazy people from Switzerland decided to travel to Portugal by train. It took us two days with nice stopovers and meetings, friends in Barcelona. We counted these days as part of the event instead of trying to travel from A to B as fast as possible. Yeah. The change has happened in our attitude. Our proof of concept works against the beliefs. No, that doesn't work. 2020, we will travel by boat, uh, ferry, not sailboat, to Latvia, to the ALE 2020. I hope more crazy people from Europe will join us. Good. Community, conference, community conferences have a lot of value, but the traveling part needs to be improved. And this is a really good example of things you can do. If you're a conference organizer, it's a perfect example. You're, you're setting an example, right? Sim, sim, simple things like encouraging people to travel. Maybe you help organize the travel to make it easy. Maybe you just, maybe you, like, here's the simplest thing in the world, right? Here's a super, really simple trick. At your company event or a conference or whatever, next time you're serving food, make vegetarian or vegan the default. And then people can, if they want meat, they can order that, right? Is that happening right now at your place? Yes. Right? Yes. 
it, it's the simplest thing in the world. You just say, because normally meat is a default and then vegetarian is special. Just turn that around. Vegetarian is default, meat is special. It's okay, you can have your meat if you want it, but you'd have to ask for it. It's such a simple thing. And it sets an example because people will be like, oh, this was actually pretty good. Uh, what is this? Oh, it's a vegetarian, you know, taco or whatever. Little things. But okay, b b back to the question about train. Um, I'm very interested in this question because I'm very irritated at the, the airplane thing. It's like, is this problem really unsolved, right? Uh, especially since I get invited to speak at conferences all over the place. And I'm like, I kind of want to go, but I kind of don't. <laughs> so uh, yeah, like I would much rather be with you now, right? But I just couldn't argue for getting on a plane and I didn't quite have the time right now to, to take the rather long train ride. So I did an experiment uh, about a year and a half ago. I decided that this year, all my traveling is going to be by train. Um, so I traveled quite a lot in Europe. So I went to Paris by train twice. I went to, um, I went to Amsterdam by train. Whenever I need to go somewhere, I just, I just took, took the train. And um, what I learned was that it works, first of all. I, worked, I learned that I like traveling by train. It's actually nice. I, can get, I get a lot of work done. It's not wasted time. Um, Stockholm to uh, Paris is about 24 hours by train. Um, if you're if you're if you're already in Europe, like not off to the side like Sweden, <laughs> then I think train is perfectly feasible. For me, living in Stockholm, what I learned is that train is is once in a while I can do train. It's not feasible as a replacement for flying on a regular basis, because it's too unreliable. It's too expensive, um, and booking is just a pain in the butt. So once in a while I will do it. Uh, but I wouldn't be able to do it consistently because if I'm going to speak in Zurich, I would need to travel, you know, two days in advance. Because if I travel <laughs> one day in advance, it will only work if I get lucky. If if any single route along the way is delayed, I'm screwed. Second thing is I will arrive tired because I will I will not be able to get a single you know all night train somewhere. I'm going to have to switch 2 a.m. and then wake up again and switch to another train 7 a.m. and I'm going to have to run like a madman because it's only a seven minute switch. And it's a fun adventure. I've done it with my kids. It's kind of cool. But doing it as a regular thing to actually have to go somewhere and do work and show up on time and then go home, not feasible today. Yet, I still think we should travel by train because the more we do it, we, we cause a system change. And it's already happening I, in Sweden. I can see it because um, travel companies are getting up, like they're getting swamped by people who are saying, hey, we want to go to a conference with our company. Uh, and we want to go by train. Can you organize that for us? That was not happening a year ago. So there's a lot of pressure to uh, make train travel cheaper and easier and more convenient and more reliable. So the more people that travel with train, the more we're gonna push that, that, that system change. So that's kind of the way I think now. I fly as little as possible. I sometimes fly, but as little as possible. Whenever possible, I, I take the train, even though, and, and when I do, I, I tend to enjoy it. I just wouldn't do it often, right? Um, one note though, you mentioned about boat, uh, do the math really go to the route and do the math before you make that decision. Uh, because I've, I've seen some indications that traveling by ferry might not actually be better than traveling by plane for short distance. Please verify it. But uh, it's just, yeah, do the math. <laughs> okay, guys, so we have time for one more question to Henrik. Okay. Um, there's one question regarding the number of uh, total funds of CO2 reduction. They go from zero web page. You point out also 270,000 tons, I think, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, mostly, right now we're up to. Uh, um, yeah, uh, 207,000 uh, right now, but just based on our, pr uh, pers our private uh, cus customers. Yeah, and. Uh, from what I've uh, seen on brief look on the, on the list of the projects in Ross, those were mainly uh, a telecom uh, uh, project. Like uh, yes, so let me find that. Uh, let me share that while you're talking. Uh, this is our list so far. Mostly power, yes. Yeah, mostly power. So my question is, um, uh, how do you calculate how much CO2 was actually saved through those projects. I mean, if you just build an extra power plant in a, in a place where it's like in India, where maybe yes. uh, 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 electricity supply is unreliable, you just yeah. add extra source and you make uh, power, uh, power supply more reliable and cheaper. 
but you don't actually reduce uh, the CO2 emissions of all the other sources that are already there. So how yes. do you make sure that the actual emission is reduced and how you measure it? Uh, we don't. But, uh, but and, and, and the reason why we don't is because we're not experts at it. So the ones who do are uh, organization, there are, there are professional um, like inspectors who verify these projects and then they get certified. So we basically concluded that we don't have the time or the competency to validate. It's extremely complicated to validate these kind of things, which, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, especially uh, additivity. <laughs> so how do we know what would have happened if I did not put my money into this project? Like, hey, we, you know, uh, we built solar panels in India and my money made that happen. Yoo-hoo. But wait a sec, what if I did not put my money into that? Maybe it would have happened anyway because it's a good business. And if that's the case, then no, my money had zero climate benefit, right? So that's additivity is, is a major problem. So we decided that that doesn't mean we shouldn't support these projects though. It just means we should, we should find the most reliable verification body. And the most reliable verification body we found is organization called Gold Standard. Um, that in conjunction with a model called CDM, which some of you are probably aware of, those two together uh, is currently the most like reliable and robust um, verification mechanism where inspectors go out to verify what actually happened. There is one twist to it though. And this is kind of interesting um, and a little bit counterintuitive. The projects we support have already been built. <laughs> we don't support projects that haven't been built yet because we don't know if, that's, if they're gonna make an impact. So instead there is a, a, a clean development mechanisms or whatever, whatever CDM stands for, is ba it's basically a financing uh, system where when someone builds, let's say a, a power plant, um, then they can finance that power plant based on the fact that it is going to reduce the carbon footprint of that country, for example. But they don't get that money until that gets verified after it's built. So after the plant is built, inspectors come over to actually measure what is the impact and do a serious assessment of what would have happened if, if this wasn't built um, and they, they redo this every seventh year to recertify them. And only then do they actually get paid. So this is an incentive mechanism that's really based on um, paying, uh, paying people after they've already proven that their thing is making a difference. So that, that, that's the, the mechanism we're currently supported, supporting. It's not iron tight, but it's the best we got. So it's all we can do. There is another interesting twist to it. A, lot of, a common question is like, how can it be so cheap? How can only five euros reduce one ton? And that's because there are projects where, like for example, the hydro plant in, in, in Vietnam, um, it was not quite uh, viable financially to build. But with just a little bit of more money through these credits, it suddenly became viable. So our money was not used to build a whole power plant. Our money was used to add a little bit of extra that changes it from being not viable to viable. And then suddenly we have this big difference. Does that make sense? The, that's one of the kind of ahas for me that, that you find these little low hanging fruit where a little bit of money makes a big difference. Uh, but yes, the short answer is we don't verify, we don't have the skills. Instead, we find the most trustworthy companies that do verify. And then we basically um, put our money there. And then we take, um, you know, make sure that it's official. We put our, all the certificates and reports, we put them on our site so anybody uh, can verify themselves.